Well, thank you very much. That's a really great pleasure to speak uh, at this seminar and also on the topic I've been working for about like last 20 years occasionally. And uh, uh, so the topic is in general about a very classical subject. So moving frames, we've, we've had tons of uh, papers and books published now on moving frames. So the question is, why would we need yet another one and another lecture series? The main idea here is to, uh, and I'll probably show you the outline of the first lecture, is to come up with uh, uh, some uh, algebraic guidance for constructing moving frames. And I have a feeling that's been missing so far. And by algebraic guidance, I mean very much the guidance we have when we deal with uh, uh, Tanaka theory of geometric structures on filtered manifolds, where we can tell really a lot without doing any uh, computations, uh, any explicit parametric computations. Uh, so the goal of this uh, series of lectures is to uh, suggest a similar framework uh, really based on uh, algebraic techniques that uh, mimics very much classical Tanaka theory, first of all. It's easier than classical Tanaka theory because it, it deals uh, uh, with some, uh, with, with just moving frames, not equivalence problems for generic geometric structures. And uh, it is very computationally effective as well. Uh, so depending on uh, one's needs, this is a generic technique that can be used with or without parametric computations. So you can get answers without going into detail, like finding the number of invariants where they see it, what's the geometric meaning of this invariance. For this, you really don't need to, to do any explicit computations. Uh, but of course, if you, if you like uh, all classical expressions, as we've seen in, in works of uh, Sophos Lee, and uh, this is why I included some classical 19th century examples in this talk, then yes, that's also available. So this is about a very general uh, overview of the, of the lecture series. The very first one, uh, I tried to be as, as simple as possible, uh, as naive as possible, uh, uh, though still with some interesting examples. Uh, We'll see how it goes. I was hoping to include a few computational examples uh, like G2 examples on curves. And this is, uh, well, a bit related to this uh, uh, recent work of Boris Koglikov and his collaborators on variants of curves uh, in G2 geometry, uh, but also how one can effectively do parametric computations on Maple. But we'll see how far we can go today and uh, if, if we are not able to cover everything today, uh, well, we still have two more lectures. Uh, so again, uh, I just say that today will be mainly naive thing, but a few algebraic examples where, well, where, where I assume that anything that is linear algebra is very simple. Well, so let's uh, probably go straight to uh, the setup. And I'll come up with is a very general definitions and set up first, and then go into the examples. Uh, so, uh, as usual, we uh, we are uh, denoting by G by P certain parabolic homogeneous space. So this is why we would be we would be uh, investigating uh, local differential geometry of submanifolds. So G is a graded Lie algebra, P is a parabolic subalgebra, so all standard notation here. Uh, then, of course, the homogeneous space itself is a nice filtered manifold. So we have a filtration of uh, tangent bundle, and uh, this filtration comes uh, from uh, essentially a flag of G invariant uh, vector distributions uh, originating. Uh, so at the origin, these are just uh, uh, G minus one, G minus one plus G minus two, G minus one plus G minus two plus G minus three, etc. So I think it's also very standard and we all know that. Uh, now, uh, a very first definition is a symbol of an, uh, of an arbitrary submanifold. 
And this is somewhat, so I especially did this in, in a manner that is that resembles uh, Tanaka theory as much as possible. Uh, so given a submanifold N, uh, in, in arbitrary submanifold so far, but we'll specialize it later a little bit. So given an arbitrary submanifold, we define a symbol at the point of this submanifold as follows. So we look at the tangent space of this submanifold, which is, of course, a subspace of TM at this point. TM itself is a filtered manifold. We have a graded associated to it. So we can take graded subspace associated to TXN, and we view it as a graded subspace uh, in G minus. And uh, it is an elementary computation to actually prove that this is not just a subspace, but a Lie algebra. It's two vector fields are tangent um, to a submanifold at the point, and their bracket will also be tangent to the submanifold at the point. So again, a definition is uh, very elementary. So at the point, take uh, a tangent uh, space to a submanifold and take a graded subspace, and then make some effort to view it as a sub-algebra in G minus. So this effort in more detail, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So uh, of course, for any, so we, we deal with homogeneous space here. So for any X uh, in M, we have uh, an action or an element G in capital G that maps this X to the origin and by origin, I mean uh, the, or set of ident element. Uh, this uh, transformation G, of course, maps, uh, differential of this transformation maps tangent space of N to a certain subspace to the tangent space at the identity of, of our homogeneous space. And then at the, at the identity, we have a very standard classical identification of uh, TM uh, with G minus. Uh, however, as G, uh, the transformation uh, is defined only modular uh, left multiplication by P, by stabilizer of the origin, then this <coughs> G star TXN is also defined modular as a joint action of P on, uh, on G minus, where we, by G minus uh, here, I mean just a vector space, or, which identifies the quotient G by P. But then we look at the graded, uh, associated, the associated graded space, and it's it's now a graded subspace in in graded G minus, and it's well defined modular the action of G zero. So it's all well defined and all very natural. And this is what we call a symbol. This resembles a bit uh, how we define. Uh, uh, symbols of any vector distributions uh, or bracket generating vector distributions, uh, where we also use uh, associated graded Lie algebras. So here, instead of Lie algebra, we get a subalgebra in G minus as a symbol. And essentially, uh, it, it uh, encodes uh, modulus um, the low degrees how Tn looks like inside Tm. Uh, so now let n be uh, an arbitrary graded subalgebra in G minus and just arbitrary. So we say that uh, a capital N submanifold N has a constant symbol, uh, frac N, if for each point, a graded uh, uh, subspace associated to the tangent space of N is G0 equivalent to uh, frac N for any point X in the manifold. So it's again, a very natural definition. So we would want to have some uh, constant symbol assumption. And in the following, we should always assume that N has a constant symbol. Uh, and this is the only assumption on N. We don't need any other assumptions at all. Uh, this, uh, I'll come with, with many examples around the symbol definition, is the definition of a symbol. So don't be afraid. Uh, uh, of uh, well, if if you if you see some uh, extra complexity here, I hope you you'll find it very natural. Uh, so, what are the main questions we would want to consider here? Uh, so, having such submanifold of a constant symbol, 
Uh, we would want to understand, for example, most semantic models, uh, any natural moving frames, number of fundamental differential invariants, and how to get other invariants, non-fundamental ones. Uh, maybe uh, in induced geometries. So what do we get as an induced geometry on uh, our submanifold? Uh, well, if it, our submanifold turns out to be just a curve, then are there any natural or oh, projective on general affine or um, uh, just uh, scalar invariant uh, on a curve? Uh, these are all questions. And ideally, we would want to have some uniform procedures that answers all these questions, just starting from this subalgebra n, from the symbol. So this is only data algebraic data we fix. Uh, 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 an arbitrary subalgebra, graded subalgebra n of g minus. And out of this uh, very little information, we would want to drive uh, at least uh, uh, generic answers to all these questions. Uh, to give you an idea how it might work in general, and uh, I'm giving this as a premier example of, uh, of results we would be getting in the future, but uh, so far without proofs, but the proofs will come later. So a very natural step for, uh, in case of Tanaka theory, is to uh, consider a Tanaka prolongation. And Tanaka prolongation uh, would serve us uh, as a certain, uh, like dimension of this prolongation would be an upper bound for a symmetry algebra of any geometric structure uh, with this Tanaka prolongation. And also would, would, would hint us what are the flat models we might have for a given geometric structures, et cetera. So it's again, I'm, mimic, I'm, I'm mimicking here absolutely the same approach. So let's define what we call intrinsic prolongation of N and G. And we define it as the largest graded subalgebra uh, such that its negative part is N. So again, prolongation of N is the largest graded subalgebra in G, such that its negative part is N. And we know that N is a subalgebra in G minus, so it's concentrated only in the negative degree. And similar to, uh, to uh, Tanaka theory, we have some inductive uh, procedure to compute this prolongation. But again, it's very much easier because in this case, we are already bound by a finite dimensional vector space G. Uh, so uh, by definition, the negative part of prolongation of n is n itself. And if you would well, one, if you go into non-negative parts, starting from zero and then one, two, and three, you just take all possible elements u in uh, gi that bracketed in n, uh, give us uh, uh, something that we already have computed. So again, it's pure linear algebra, uh, really easy computation. In, in, in all examples I've seen, it was, it was really easy to compute. Uh, and again, uh, it, it samples as a somewhat a similar approach to Tanaka, but only by words, because the computations here are very much easier. Uh, so, and the very first theorem we might get uh, and I'm giving it a, as a really uh, a typical example of results we would be getting in the future. The proof of this will come only in lecture three. Uh, but again, so this is a striking similarity with what we have in classical Tanaka theory. So we have that uh, the dimension of a symmetry of N is bound by the dimension of this prolongation. And uh, uh, this equality is achieved if and only if n is locally equivalent to the orbit of the subgroup that corresponds to our prolongation. So by x pro n, I denote actually a subgroup generated by exponential of n. So a subgroup uh, with a, with a subalgebra of prolongation of n. And again, if and only if statement is very special to parabolic geometries. So it wouldn't work, for, for example, in Euclidean geometry and uh, uh, in other non-parabolic uh, geometries, I'm not sure about. Yeah, in, it wouldn't also work in equifine geometry, I think. Um, so 
So this if and only if statement is uh, is there actually is a result of a presence of the gating element inside G. But again, it makes things very nice. And that tells us that for any M, we have a unique flat model, and our flat model uh, would be exactly the orbit of the subgroup that corresponds to the prolongation of N. And any other submanifold with a symbol N will have a uh, uh, slightly smaller dimension of a symmetry algebra. Uh, and in general, the idea is, of course, that we'll try to approximate any uh, submanifold with a constant symbol and with our flat model, but this will come much later. So this is, uh, uh, as I say, this is a very general definition and uh, a very general proce prolongation procedure and um, a very general, uh, like, uh, bound result on the dimensions of the symmetry bounds and the presence of a flat model. And I thought it, <coughs> even if it doesn't sound uh, totally elementary, elementary, I thought it would probably make sense to, <coughs> sorry, to present it immediately on the very first slides to just uh, give you a hint where we are heading to. So we'll, well, very soon we'll uh, start slowing down considerably and uh, looking at elementary examples as a general theory. But uh, uh, I thought that kind of overview uh, would already be very appealing. Uh, any questions so far, by the way? Okay, uh, we'll move. This submanifold N is again some uh parabolic homogeneous space for some parabolic subgroup that is bigger than the initial one? No, no really? assumptions. The only assumption is that it has a constant symbol. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely no other assumptions or requirements on that. So it doesn't tell that it's homogeneous space, this N again? Uh, and itself, no, it's an arbitrary, uh, uh, the flat model that is an orbit of prolongation of n inside homogeneous space is, of course, itself a homogeneous space by definition because it's an orbit of a subgroup in G, but n is absolutely arbitrary. And it will have, in general, a non constant uh, invariance. Uh, Boris. Yep. Uh, just to be sure. Um, so imagine in general, if one considers the induced geometric structure on N from the ambient space, yep. uh, the induced symmetries are potentially more than uh, what you have in this theorem, right? Uh, yes. Sorry, the, the intrinsic symmetries, the intrinsic symmetries. Uh, yes, that's right. So there might be more intrinsic symmetries than extrinsic ones, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and and by the way, uh, vice versa is also possible. Sometimes you have more extrinsic symmetries than intrinsic, and the reason is that some extrinsic symmetries simply act ineffective, ineffectively. So it just present there's, there's, there's the symmetries that uh, uh, preserve all points of n. So the relationship between extrinsic and intrinsic geometries is, uh, is actually a quite interesting question in this theory. Probably one of the most interesting. Thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, let's now uh, look at a very basic example. Uh, and uh, well, so far it's not completely basic. So let's assume we are in a projective space, uh, PN, and we are looking for uh, hypersurfaces. So our, our uh, Submanifold n has dimension n minus one, so four dimension one. Of course, that's one of the most classical uh, probably homogeneous spaces. So the group G will be uh, PGL n plus one R. P is a uh, what I don't know. P one uh, is a parabolic subgroup here, which just preserves a one dimensional subspace inside uh, R n plus one. And we have initial identification of G minus with just G minus one. And uh, so this is what's given here. Here I identify G, G itself is uh, n plus, well, 
uh, so I split uh, n plus one by n plus one matrices as one n one n. So it's not indicated here, but you have a hint here that X is actually n by one matrices here. Uh, so G zero is GLNR itself. It acts, of course, transitively on all subspaces of four dimension one and G minus one. So if you if you would want to understand what are possible symbols that we'll have for a hypersurface, they're all equivalent. They just uh, you can fix uh, an arbitrary uh, four dimension one linear subspace in G minus one and a fixed one. So essentially, I, I take a standard uh, subspace uh, in Rn spanned by n minus one first coordinate vectors. And uh, I, I, I know that any hypersurface uh, by, uh, by trivial uh, reasoning has the symbol. So the symbol doesn't say much uh, at that point, it just says that. Uh, uh, and itself is of dimension n minus one. So nothing fancy if you look at the symbol at this moment. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, again, if you look at the prolongation of the symbol, we'll just uh, recover a flat model, which will be hyperplane in PN, so a linear subspace of four dimension one. And likely the subgroup in this case, uh, as a symmetry group, so the prolongation is yet another parabolic. And that's a parabolic that is typically denoted as Pn in GL, G, well, PGL n plus one R, and it consists of all transformations that preserve a co dimension one linear subspace. Uh, it's it's well-known fact that in the intersection of two parabolics is again a parabolic. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, well, at least in this, yeah, sorry, that was that was uh, probably uh, too fast. No, it's of course, in our case, we have the intersection P1 with Pn as, as another parabolic, where one dimensional subspace is contained in this n-dimensional subspace, n-dimensional subspace, right? And uh, in general, G by P1n is naturally identified with, uh, well, you may choose whether it's, uh, Jet spaces of all hyper uh, surfaces in PN or a cotangent bundle of PN, if you like. This is a contact manifold uh, uh, of dimension uh, 2n uh, minus 1. Uh, so, what happens here? Uh, we have a very natural lift of our uh, uh, submanifold N into this new bigger homogeneous space G by P1N, which just takes uh, any point X in N into the tangent space in, uh, in this uh, new parabolic homogeneous space. Uh, so tangent space to hypersurface will become a point in this uh, well, bigger uh, parabolic homogeneous space G by P1N. And now if you look at the symbol of the prolongation, then we start getting something more interesting. So we actually recover a second fundamental form for our submanifold. Uh, it is uh, uh, encoded here as the matrix S, so we can easily check that any symbol uh, uh, will sit inside any symbol of a symbol of a prolonged submanifold uh, will sit in uh, degree minus one elements, first of all, where the degree is now changed because we we fixed not just a line, but also a hybrid space. Uh, uh, so classifying symbols in this case is equivalent actually to classifying N minus one by N minus one matrices, uh, symmetric matrices up to the standard action of GL and minus one. And uh, that's so now fixing a symbol would mean that we are fixing essentially the type of our second fundamental form. And here, where actually uh, the geometry of uh, hypersurfaces in PN normally starts. So I, I'm in particular, if you take curves in P2, that's probably the easiest example, then. Um, what we will be getting uh, is uh, this symbol n. Uh, if you assume that our submanifold is not aligned, sorry, so I probably had to exclude this explicitly. But if we are not uh, in the case of lines, then uh, we actually our symmetric matrix S is just a single uh, uh, 
scalar coefficient. If it's non-zero, then we can easily normalize it to one. So we get uh, a symbol n given as this uh, lower diagonal uh, triangular matrix n on the left. And uh, yeah, actually, you you probably see my mouse here. So this is uh, this is our symbol n. And uh, a prolongation is very easy to compute. We get a cell two sitting inside the cell three. Uh, that's not surprising because uh, this is exactly the symmetry algebra of a non-degenerate conic in P2. So flat curves, uh, like flat model curves, will be conics now. And the prolongation of n uh, recovers the symmetry algebra of a coin in a purely algebraic way again. So just starting from this nilpotent element sitting in a cell, uh, in cell three. Uh, and in general, uh, such lift of n uh, to a larger parabolic geometry, which is uh, known as a correspondence space, uh, is uh, works always when the prolongation. Can you, can, you, can you also comment on the case when it's line? Yeah, uh, uh, when it's a line, yeah. then uh, the, our s will vanish identically. So instead of uh, Y sitting here in the, in the uh, sorry in the uh, in the uh, last row we would have zero here, so the prolongation of n would not change, and this would mean that uh, uh, we are in the case where our uh, like we are in, a, in the case of an exceptional manifold which is a line. So prolongation will be still as as also. No, 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 no. Prolongation will be uh, uh, prolongation. I didn't write it here. So if if you have zero here, the prolongation will be, uh, I think, first two rows completely, yeah. and uh, two, two zeros in the two first zeros in the third line. So, so it's non-effective fraction. Something you you discuss. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's clear. So if you look at the line in P two. Yeah. And uh, the symmetry of a line is indeed a cell two, but this, uh, sorry, so the symmetry of a line in, in P2 uh, is uh, uh, six dimensional. And of course it acts ineffectively on the line itself. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I wanted to show is that this trick of lift uh, is very useful. And essentially, you would want to lift your submanifold as high as possible till you really start analyzing the symbols. And of course, on the way of prolonging, uh, you might come up with some exceptional uh, curves and submanifolds, normally very uh, special ones like lines in P2. So the real theory starts when you get some non-degenerate symbol, generic symbol here, which corresponds to points. Okay, so uh, let's uh, play a little bit. And I, I, I wanted to play a little bit with possible uh, case of G2. So I'm, I'm switching now to... Uh, uh, different uh, screen so let's let's try to do some drawing do you see my paint program there so yes. I'll, I'll remember the thing because it'll be coming to me quite often. so uh, we are in uh, the situation where we have uh, so when we uh, have uh, uh, yeah when we have uh, Sorry, make it size bigger. Yeah, when we have G equal to G2, uh, P equal to P2. So G by P is actually a five dimensional uh, contact uh, G2 geometry. And uh, this corresponds to the grading uh, where you have this minus two, minus one, zero, one, two here. This is a degrees of in the root system of G2. Uh, and we have four dimensional subspace, uh, contact space corresponding to degree minus one. So let us now play with uh, symbols. Let us check what are possible symbols and their prolongations in this case. Uh, so uh, there are, of course, a very first, 
what, what is a, what is a, a symbol in our case? This is a certain, uh, as, we, as we speak about curves, this is a one dimensional uh, graded subalgebra in G minus, which is five dimensional and is concentrated in degrees minus one and minus two. So we of course have two choices, whether it sits in degree minus one or it sits in degree minus two, whether, and if it sits, if the symbol sits in degree minus one, then this means that our curves are actually <coughs> uh, contact curves or tangent to the contact distribution. If, the, uh, if our symbol sits in degree minus two, this means that we deal with curves which are, are transversal to the contact distribution. So probably transversal case is uh, a bit easier. So then we have no choice uh, here because uh, degree minus two is, is already or one dimensional. So let's suppose that our symbol n is this thing. So let's compute it. its prolongation. And uh, it is uh, elementary to see that the prolongation. So all this, uh, of course, we don't have elements minus one, degree minus one is a prolongation. So, but all elements in degree zero do sit in the prolongation. Uh, and then degree one will not be in the prolongation because they move element of degree minus two into minus one, which we do not have in the prolongation. But this one will sit uh, there here. So as a result, we see that our prolonged uh, uh, n uh, is exactly SL2 times SL2 uh, uh, sitting in G2 exactly in this way. So we would expect that our flat models uh, will have a SL2 times SL2 symmetry. And um, uh, one of those SL2 will probably act uh, or diagonal uh, would act uh, effectively, the other will not. And this will be the model we could use to analyze all curves of degree minus two and of, of, of all, all curves which are not, uh, uh, which are transversal to the contact distribution. And how exactly we are going to do this? This is a topic of a, this is a subject of actually the second lecture. So uh, let's now look at, for example, um, uh, the case where we have uh, elements of degree. Uh, if if, if uh, the case where n is concentrated in degree minus one, this so is somewhere here uh, in degree minus one. Uh, this is a four dimensional space. So to determine all possible symbols, we need to classify the uh, orbits of the action of uh, GL2 on the four dimensional reducible representation. This is the just UV binary forms. So they're all easily classified by the types of per or types of multiplicities of roots. So we have cases like three to one and one, one, one. These are multiplicities of three roots of this. Um, and uh, family, uh, well, uh, uh, form. Well, no, it's binary form of degree three, yes. Uh, so, uh, in particular, if uh, uh, if it is a triple root, then we know that this would correspond to the like uh, lowest, the highest vector in this representation. So it will be this case. And uh, and then uh, we could check that actually the uh, prolongation of the thing will be uh, will consist of all elements sitting here, and will will be again a parabolic subgroup. And as we did this uh, in the previous uh, in the projective case, so to say. Well, this is exactly the case where we prolong our curves uh, to uh, the geometry G2 by P12. Forrest. Yeah. Um, one of those vectors in this, what you circled, I don't think that's in the prolongation, the one going directly. Oh, yeah. Up. Yes, that's correct. That's Thank you. So I have to be more careful. Um, uh, uh, let's probably just. Uh, yeah, so I have to exclude this one. This one will not be in the prolongation. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, prolongation sitting 
like this one, and including this one, of course. Still, uh, still uh, uh, a parabolic. Uh, again, I'm leaving this as an exercise to analyze further what kind of uh, uh, symbols we would get if we prolong our curve to G2 by P12. But again, that will be very uh, somewhat similar to projective situation. Uh, so if you now consider two other cases, so uh, which are the, multipli the curves of multiplicity to one, then we can uh, check that it actually corresponds to, it can be identified with this, uh, with the lines that corresponds to this vector. This does have exactly double root and the single root. And then uh, the prolongation is, uh, is like that. So it, it is, uh, and one dimensional subspace inside G0. So it's not too all, we don't pick the complete Cartan subalgebra, but only one dimensional subspace. Uh, no, actually, sorry. So if you take without all, all the, so if you take all, all, all the here, uh, two dimensional subspace, we have uh, this thing forms a cell two. This is an additional element. So we get a cell two times a two dimensional uh, solvable uh, Lie algebra embedded in exactly this way into G2. And, and yeah, well, this would be a model for all curves uh, which are tangent to the contact distribution and was tangent line corresponds to elements or, or to the forms of the case three with uh, double root. So a generic one would be uh, this thing uh, where we have uh, no double roots, so it's uh, multiplicity uh, multiplicity one one one, and uh, I I use the following notation to denote them. So I, I put uh, dot here dot here, but I connect them because it's a linear combination of this two. And then uh, actually there will be now one dimensional subspace picked up here, uh, and uh, and some prolongation here. So it's again, uh, some linear combinations that break it with this element and uh, uh, goes into this stabilizer of this element uh, uh, in G0. And so there will be like a cell two only here. Uh, and it's not surprising that the dimension of the sink is uh, the smallest here. So it's only three because we are taking a generic contact tangent line now. Generic means that we have one, one, one here. So this, so we would have natural branching when we would want to study such curves uh, by the types of the symbols. So like symbol sitting in degree minus two, symbol sitting in degree minus one, and then uh, we have the split into the three different uh, uh, orbits, and for each of such symbols, we, we may compute prolongation, which is, uh, again, uh, as I say, quite elementary uh, linear algebra. We get uh, the symmetry algebra for each of the like, flat model and the symmetry uh, at bound for a symmetry algebra, and would then naturally proceed analyzing each of such branches similar, uh, separate. Uh, any questions uh, so far? because I'm going back to the lecture, I mean, to the slides. No, good of you. Okay. Um, so now returning to the slides, uh, uh, let us uh, check uh, one more example. And this other example is uh, actually how we would go further and try to construct invariance if you know the symbol. And I'm now uh, going to uh, uh, very like the simplest possible example I know. These are curves in P2, so projective geometry of curves. And before going into moving frame techniques and how the symbol would be used here to construct a moving frame and uh, uh, fundamental invariance. Let us probably summarize a few things around how this uh, was done before moving frame techniques. So of course we have a classical approach of Sofus -Sof Lee. So he has developed a uniform analytic 
technique. I call it analytic because it's a lot of analytic computations and also sol solving certain PGs, in fact. So how one computes differential invariance of submanifolds under a finite or even infinite dimensional transformation group. So one just goes and goes with prolonging this infinitesimal transformations to jet spaces. Uh, well, one needs to go to sufficiently high order so that uh, uh, they act non-transitively there at a generic point and then uh, try to integrate, to try to find the orbit of such action. Uh, so uh, some, even before reaching the level where uh, the action becomes non-transitive, one may get a, a lower dimensional invariance uh, invariance of lower degree. So in some jet spaces of lower order, lower dimension, uh, we might have so-called uh, singular orbits where at the generic point, the transformation group is transitive, but at some uh, uh, singular, very special points, it stops to be transitive. So this, uh, uh, well, this is, uh, there is a method that is called Lee determinants which actually analyzes the dimensions of the orbits. So if you have a number of, if you have a finite number of vector fields, you just take uh, the coefficients of this vector fields, um, uh, build the matrix out of this and check the ranks of this matrix. So this is uh, why you- Boris, if I can comment on this, yep. I think that Lee determinants works for, o, for scalar ODEs, even for, uh, for systems. Yeah, of course, you, you, you look into matrices and ranks, but that, that's not coming from the determinants. Yeah, well, the determinants in general just check whether well, your, your Lie algebra uh, uh, is non transitive, so to say. No, it, it does. Yeah, yeah it, it gives you actually a relative invariance, right? So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what they were saying. So, but, uh, but, but this works for when the mission grows by one for ODs. Um, uh, dimension grows high uh, for scalar ODs. Uh, as, as otherwise, not actually. You... Okay, I, okay. So that's, that's kind of, yeah. I, I think like all, all the rights in his book, like that lead determinants, so well, works. Well, I'm not sure where this ODs come from. I don't speak yet about ODs actually. <laughs> I just speak about functions on jets. And uh, so if I have an orbit and uh, there is a function that determines this orbit, then clearly, well, an ideal to be precise, then this ideal will be invariant. Yes, so maybe this is, so if, if the orbit is of, of four dimension more than one, then it is determined not by a single function. Yeah, it's this is probably what you, what you, you, you meant. Yeah. But anyway, so if you look, in our projective case, this works perfect. So in projective case, uh, using this method of lead determinants, we uh, recover two such singular orbits, like why, Two equal to zero, and then this uh, fifth order ODE actually is determines all cubics. So I use here as a notation uh, with lower indices for simplicity, but they, they do correspond to derivatives of y with respect to x, for example. And uh, one needs to go to up to seven sort of jets to actually recover uh, some what we, what we call absolute invariants. So essentially, uh, if you have a curve, uh, in P2, and you would want to get some absolute invariance uh, via Lee method, uh, you, you need to differentiate, se differentiate it seven times and uh, in, in get uh, eight vector fields on nine dimensional uh, manifold, which is J7 RR and try to integrate. This is quite conversion computation, but Lee did, Sophos Lee did it perfectly well, and he did come with very explicit uh, uh, expressions, at least in this case, which I'm not giving here. Uh, I'm just outlining the approaches. Uh, so another approach, uh, which is due to uh, Alphen, uh, and uh, that was like, uh, I think it was then repeated by uh, Wilczynski for higher order systems, and Alphan actually uh, did a very detailed computation of this case um, uh, for plain curves. But the general idea is to include any curve in, in P2 is a third order linear differential equation such that its basis of the solution spaces is just projective coordinates of the curve. As the basis is defined up to linear transformations, the curve is defined up to projective transformations. So this is exactly what we want. 
So then we do some change of variables and uh, that's known as uh, Laguerre for site normal form. So we kill coefficients P1 and P2. What will be lab P0 is exactly the, uh, this actually fifth order relative invariant we've seen before in the previous slide. And uh, one can verify this uh, uh, explicitly. So if uh, we have a curve parameterized as a, a graph of U of T, uh, then this means that T and U of T are two uh, affine coordinates of our curve, but the projective coordinates will be then one T U of T. So you can explicitly write uh, um, third order UDE with this basis of solutions. It will uh, actually uh, uh, have uh, no, uh, yeah, it will have P zero equal to zero actually. But then you would need to normalize it uh, by killing P1 and P2 and then recover P0. And then you, you end up exactly with this uh, uh, invariant of uh, this expression. Uh, so this is how potentially you may analyze geometry or projective geometry of curves. So various approaches, uh, one straightforward using jet space computation, Another one linking projective geometry of curves with uh, geometry of linear differential equations. So I'm now, uh, uh, I'd like to show how this works for, uh, uh, in case of, uh, so in, in, the, in the approach that uh, was uh, developed by Eli Cartan. And this is what we call today moving frame approach. And I will show this in detail only for curves today. Um, so again, uh, a very general discussion of what is a moving frame. Uh, well, just, well, I'm sure you all probably know this, but I wanted to make, to, to establish a clear uh, uh, dictionary of, of the words we use, what do we understand by a frame? So of course, moving frames originate from Fresnel frames for curves and median probably space. And uh, uh, so what is a frame? So the main, the only requirement for a frame is that for any two frames, there is a unique or at most finite transformation now transformation groups that maps one frame to another. So that's, that's what we would define as a frame. So in case of uh, Euclidean transformations, it's just uh, uh, an orthonormal frame. In case of equifine transformations, for example, three vectors, Attached to a point in the fine space such that the, um, the volume uh, of the corresponding uh, parallel peak is one, so something like that, and etc. Uh, so in each geometry, uh, you may come up with this very synthetic way of defining a uh, uh, notion of a frame. But for us, uh, a frame, uh, so if you speak about homogeneous space, G by P, a frame over a point X is just an arbitrary element G that maps an origin to this point X, nothing else. Because frames are one-to-one -one with transformations, we just call transformations themselves frames. Uh, so now uh, if we have, uh, the, so it, what is a moving frame then? So suppose we now have a submanifold N. Uh, we uh, take a pullback of the submanifold in G. So we have a natural projection, of course, P going from G to G by P. So we take pi minus one of N. That's a certain sub subset in G. Well, it's not just a subset because um, uh, G itself, G over uh, G by P is a uh, principal bundle. So we get this principal bundle uh, here as well. So the Q minus one over N will be also a principal P bundle over N. And the notation, so Q minus one, uh, I start adopting the, the notation already for, uh, for what I would need in the future. So don't be uh, uh, surprised that I have this very uh, strange index minus one. Uh, so this Q minus one is just all frames that sit over N, all points of N. So a moving frame then, moving frame is an arbitrary section of this bond, nothing else. 
So for each point inside uh, uh, point of our submanifold, then I choose a transformation that maps an origin to this point. And that's right P bundle by definition. Uh, so, uh, so far it was uh, just a language. Now we would want to somehow choose between, so of course there are many local sections in particular. So we would want to get some nice sections, which would be like canonically defined over submanifold. And uh, in particular, like Frenet frame uh, uh, is constructed canonically for Euclidean curves. Uh, so how it is done? So the node by omega Marvel Cartan form on G. So we will be uh, defining frames by imposing some linear conditions on the pullback of omega uh, uh, via S. So omega sits on G, we can restrict G to Q minus one and then using S uh, pull it back to uh, N itself. It will be then uh, a G valued uh, one form uh, on our submanifold N. What we are going to do, we are going to try to choose S in a smart way. And by smart way means that um, it requires that uh, this uh, form as star omega uh, takes values in some nice subspace inside the little algebra G. Just to uh, probably emphasize that this is exactly how it works in Frenet frame. So if we uh, uh, recall a, a definition of a Frenet frame, then we actually can uh, say that uh, a Frenet frame is a unique uh, frame, uh, up, well, up to orientation, so up to plus minus sign, such that S star omega takes values in this three-dimensional subspace. So what is here on the right? Here, this is a three-dimensional subspace in the uh, Euclidean, is the Lie algebra of Euclidean transformations, which is a so three uh, semi-times RC. So this is, in general, uh, this uh, three-dimensional sub, this Lie algebra is six-dimensional. So we fix a three-dimensional subspace and then say a Frenet frame of a, for a curve is just any section uh, such that uh, a pullback of a market form is this nice. So especially it has two zeros in the right column, which actually means that our first uh, uh, frame is aligned with the tangent dimension of the curve, tangent line of the curve. And uh, and then, yeah, I think it all says, it's all set here. So I'm not going into the detail, but just uh, if you don't believe me, just verify that this can be taken as a definition of a Frenet frame. Uh, and Frenet frame itself is, is defined by fixing this exact three-dimensional subspace in the source three semi -times. And uh, then of course, um, sigma is very important here because um, uh, uh, our curve, uh, I didn't say anything about parameterization yet. So our submanifold was uh, just an arbitrary unparameterized curve. And uh, sigma is used to define an arc lens parameterization. So you, you essentially integrate it uh, so it's one form on a one dimensional manifold. So you can uh, uh, integrate it and uh, get a function, which will be your arc length parameterization. And in most of the computations, you don't want to integrate this actually. You just know that it exists. Uh, so now let us uh, check how the same idea by fixing a nice normalization conditions works uh, for projective curves. And uh, I give here an exact reference where uh, Carton was discussing this uh, in, a, in quite detailed way. Uh, so again, uh, if you, uh, I use here as an notation gamma for a curve. Uh, so the subspace that uniquely defines us, the moving frame along the projective curve is given by this uh, matrix. So this is a four dimensional subspace inside uh, SL3, uh, Lie algebra SL3, traceless three by three matrices. So as you can see, it's, it's exactly, so it has four independent entries here. 
Uh, so I give this as a final answer, but I'll, I'll show you how actually what this space can be constructed. It is naturally split into two blocks. And this block we've seen already, this block is exactly resembles here is the symmetry algebra of a conic plus some extra bits. So uh, the statement, and this is what Likertan does, he proves that for any curve, you can construct a canonical moving frame, uh, which is a bundle over our curve, uh, such that, uh, well, sigma, well, as sigma star omega takes values in this four dimensional space. And actually, uh, these two components, I split them, I split this uh, space into two parts um, in a very natural manner. So, this first part will be, uh, will take values in the symmetry algebra of our uh, flat model. Uh, in, the, in the symmetry algebra of a conic, and it will actually define us the intrinsic geometry on the curve, which will be in this case, a projective connection, but a flat one because it sits on a one dimensional space and any, by definition, any, any connection on the one dimensional space will be flat because we have no, no non-vanishing two forms. So in this case, we, this, this first part will give us uh, a, a well-defined uh, projective connection on an arbitrary curve, which is, well, I probably had to emphasize here. So I'm assuming here that we are, I, this is not a line, so not the general one. Uh, and in particular, uh, each flat uh, projective connection says that uh, your manifold is actually uh, locally equivalent to a projective line uh, up to certain natural equivalence. And this is what is normally called a projective parameter. So any curve in any non-line non curve in uh, P2 uh, gets this way a natural projective parameter. Well, this part here on the right, an additional omega one or zero two piece would give you uh, a transversal invariance, so to say. It will measure how far our curve is away from being a, a, a conic. So in particular, we will get a, a relative invariant by uh, just uh, dividing omega. So these are omega O2 and omega 1, 0. These are two one forms. We can divide one by another. This will give us a function, and we can prove that this function will be actually uh, exactly the, that as the same uh, fifth order uh, relative invariant uh, we've seen uh, in Sophosley approach. And uh, uh, we'll recover the same result that our curve is a conic, if and only if uh, this k equal to zero, this relative invariant is zero, or in other words, if uh, this transversal component omega O2 vanishes identically. Uh, so what's the benefit of this approach? So you're probably you don't see why it's so different from, well, we don't get any new results, but at least we understand much better what we are doing here. So we are getting um, uh, our moving frame nicely aligned with the symmetry algebra of a flat model. And we have two parts. One of them defines us the intrinsic geometry and the other part gives us uh, the, well, uh, extrinsic invariance of which, or transversal invariance of a curve. And this is exactly the model we, we would try to approach for uh, any other submanifold with a fixed symbol in the parabolic homogeneous space. So, uh, how much time do I have? I mean, uh, you can't talk for. Uh, half, I mean, depends uh, your preference, but uh, we can continue for 15, 20 minutes. So yeah, I've got actually just uh, examples left. So <laughs> all theoretical results are done. So I, I, I wanted to give you an idea how such uh, uh, moving frames are constructed. 
and second, how this can be used in param uh, for parametric computations to to retrieve explicit formulae for invariants. Boris, can I just ask a question? Yeah. Just to try to uh, think more generally, like. How do you predict the that second component? I mean, the, the Tanaka prolongation that you uh, introduced gives you the first component, right? The, yeah, the, exactly. So how, how do you predict uh, the, the latter part? Uh, like in this example, probably it's not that part. Yeah. I'm thinking more, trying to think more generally. Yes. Uh, there are two, two answers here. One of them, you just uh, try and guess it as here. Okay. The other, the other uh, uh, is sometimes you may use uh, uh, a more uniform approach, uh, similar to what you use in uh, uh, Tanaka theory in case of parabolic geometries. So actually in cases where the uh, flat model defines you uh, a nice geometry itself. So like semi-simple geometry, for example, or reductive. Uh, then you may use some algebraic theory, like similar to like, you may try to construct some, you use healing form uh, on your Lie algebra to, uh, on your Lie algebra G, I mean, uh, to find out this uh, complementary second component uh, in a uniform way as well. But in general, no one guarantees that it exists at all. So we are just lucky here that it exists and uh, is nicely aligned with the symmetry algebra of a flat model. Uh, may, may, may I also ask yep. the same story? How do you see its fifth order? Uh, it will come to this immediately very soon. So that's, uh, you You need to check how many iterations you need to reach to mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. And actually I do have like a very explicit computation exactly illustrating this. So, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, let's move forward. So how, how it is constructed. So, so we do certain iterations. And uh, first we start with this uh, one dimensional, I'm sorry for inconsistency in, in notation. So I used gamma and then at the same time. So here I switch back to N. So we have a curve in P2, we lift it to the first jet space. Um, the jet space of curves in P2, which is G by P12. P12 in this case is just Borel. And uh, as, uh, before we define Q minus one as a certain, uh, is it just pullback? Oh, sorry, is, is an inverse image of N1 uh, with respect to the natural projection from G to this jet space. And uh, then we denote uh, uh, by omega minus one, the restriction of omega to Q minus one. So this minus one is not a degree. Probably I should use a different notation here. So we know by definition that because our curve is a lift of a curve from the plane, that the restriction will be like that. So the only condition we have at that moment that uh, our curve is uh, tangent to the natural contact distribution that exists on J1. So it has uh, is the, so the, for any section, so omega minus one takes values here. So for any section you can take from n to q minus one, we'll end up in this subspace. So what we are doing next, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, sorry, it's two one here. So we see that omega two one vanishes, vanishes identically if and only if the curve is a straight line. So we can assume that omega two one is non-zero. And then we uh, say that we, we reduce a bundle Q minus one to Q zero, where Q zero is all points where omega one minus one takes values in a smaller subspace. So this is a seven dimensional subspace. Now we go into six dimensional subspace. And this is a, like zero, uh, we call it zero uh, reduction step. 
So at that moment, we, we just pick up only those points where Marika transform takes values in this uh, space where these two slots are the same. And uh, we can check uh, uh, what is, uh, so this is a reduction. So our P12 is reduced at that moment because we, we put some constraints on our points. And uh, this is actually the subgroup uh, that will be structure group for Q0 here. So you see, we see that uh, we, we killed just one dimensional the diagonal. In general, the diagonal is two dimensional. And uh, by assuming that these two slots are the same, we reduced it to one dimensional sub subgroup here. So we, we have a six dimensional normalization subspace and uh, at that moment, four dimensional subgroup. Uh, next is again very natural thing. So we just restrict our uh, Marika term from Q to Q0 and uh, see what else we can uh, normalize here. So it's, it's, it's the game, the same game as normalizations and reductions. Uh, so we, we just make sure that we get zero slot here. So this is yet another condition. So uh, originally uh, we were taking values in uh, six dimensional subspace. Now this is a five dimensional subspace. Um, and again, how do we choose this? We look at how uh, these forms uh, are transformed under these transformations. And exactly in this slot, we notice because in the subgroup here, we have uh, one, then we, we know that this slot will be transformed in, in a purely algebraic way. And we see that we can normalize it to zero. And we, uh, this actually reduces our structure group to this one. So this is a group that consists of the product of this two matrices. I, sp I split it into two parts just to have a PO1 nicely aligned here on the right without extra case. And we uh, repeat it once again. So we see what else we can now uh, uh, normalize. And what we are now normalizing, we are making sure that uh, uh, O1 slot and uh, uh, one, two slots are the same. We align them and you see, we start aligning our Marukka form form with, with what I would want to have uh, uh, as a final answer. So with, uh, with uh, symmetry algebra of our flat model. And uh, this is actually the final uh, normalization step. So Q2 is defined uh, here as this one. And, uh, and then the structure group at that point is reduced to uh, this two dimensional subgroup. So we kill essentially the coefficient PO2 by normalizing to this subspace. And this is already the answer we wanted to get. So we are getting uh, uh, a three dimensional, uh, a, a cell two valued uh, form on uh, over a one dimension on, on a, on a on a three-dimensional bundle over one-dimensional manifold. And the structure group of this bundle is exactly uh, also nicely aligned with the uh, symmetry group of our flat model, which is a conic. So this uh, P, well, this, this product, the product of the two matrices is exactly uh, like uh, the remaining two-dimensional transformations that fix a point. Um, and uh, keep the conic stable. And this other slot, uh, o, uh, omega zero two is exactly the slot that uh, is left free. And this is where uh, invariance will, will uh, show up. So now, uh, how many derivatives do we need to take if you want to do this uh, uh, explicitly? So uh, we had to do how many three reduction steps, but we were actually taking first two derivatives to define uh, the initial, uh, the omega Cartan form, because one of them comes from the prolongation. And to N1, we take one derivative. And another one, when we compute uh, my Cartan form itself, because it's just G minus one DG where, uh, uh, well, it's a definition of my Cartan form. So this way we knew that uh, uh, this coefficient here would normally include fifth degree, uh, fifth derivatives of the initial data of the curve. So this is about how we see uh, why we, 
uh, would uh, end up with uh, invariance of degree five, relative invariance of degree five. And uh, very explicitly, here is a, I have a Maple worksheet now. Uh, let's let's probably see how it works in Maple. I know we all like doing some Maple computations. Morris, can you do you mind yep. just going through that uh, that order calculation again? Yeah. So, how many times we had some reductions? So we did first reduction assuming uh, omega to one is equal one zero. That's one. Second one is assuming that we have zero here, that's two. And third reduction when we are assuming that this omega zero one and omega one two coincide three. On each step, we actually are uh, uh, choosing, uh, no, adjusting it? our section. And by adjusting our section, we transform, or uh, uh, we use uh, the transformations for omega, uh, for Maroc-Cartan form. So Maroc-Cartan form is, uh, adjusted by the element like g minus one dg, as I said. So we are introducing one derivative at each step of this reduction procedure. So each step of the reduction procedure means one derivative. And- uh, Pre-normalization. Two, two other, yeah, each normalization step uh, means one derivative and two other derivatives we were taking. So first one, when we were lifting n to n1, because we are taking tangent uh, line, uh, tangent line to a curve. Okay. And the other one that we were computing uh, initial Maroc-Cartan form for uh, this lift, because this would also include uh, one more derivative. Okay. Yeah. So, so in total, this are like one uh, going from n to n1, another one computing uh, omega minus one, and then going through the normalization procedures plus one derivative each time. Okay. So in total, five derivatives. So I guess this is also how one can show that the first absolute invariant is uh, seventh of, of uh, yep. seventh order because you need another two normal uh, normalizations. Yeah, exactly. So you need to kill. Yeah, sorry, you need to kill two remaining coefficients. Two, two remaining two two dimensions in the remaining structure group. Exactly. Like a very typical normalization, next normalization condition would be to say that if this omega uh, zero two slot is non zero, let's make it equal to omega one zero. This would yet reduce us, probably this would kill us P zero zero, uh, and one more normalization to kill P zero one. And then we'll, uh, we'll reach indeed the uh, canonical uh, moving frame where we have no bundle, no longer any, any freedom, bundle freedom. So this will be seven sorted. Yep, so thanks for the snob. Um, just a second, so. Uh, I'm trying to yeah, find uh, maples here. Why oh, I'm not able to. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So here is a maple worksheet here. And I'll go through this very briefly because we probably we already spent quite some time. And I do not use anything here, any packages whatsoever, just very, very trivial linear algebra. So uh, this is my initial freedom, uh, uh, bundle freedom P. This is uh, uh, what happens, is I have to choose an initial, so I choose an arbitrary section uh, over uh, for omega minus one essentially at that point. So what is uh, what is the uh, section at that point? It, it just maps uh, x y to these two slots x and y, and I then compute uh, g minus one dg. So x. Uh, so essentially, this is uh, this omega is this matrix dx. So dx. So here it's not one; it's dx, and here it's y prime dx. And uh, then I, at, this, at each step, I, I use a very standard thing. 
So I try to adjust my frame uh, by multiplying it uh, from the right on, on, on uh, using the right multiplication of my bundle. And at each moment, I uh, the transformation of omega uh, goes like that. So it's p minus one omega p plus p minus one, and this is this is what I do when I differentiate. So I applied differentiation to all slots of matrix P. I, I don't know how to do it better, but I just, so it's my P minus one DP if you wish. And that's of course quite uh, ugly expressions here, but uh, I know what I would want to do. So I would want to have zero here, first of all. So I, I check what is uh, uh, what I have in, in the slot C1. So I have just of course a linear transformation of this matrix. And uh, I want it to be zero, so I, I solve it. I, I see that I can use P1, P21 here to, to make it zero. And actually I have to make P1, P21 equal to the thing. So I choose this uh, matrix to adjust my initial section. And then apply the same trick. So I apply the same transformation. I end up now with this omega one. So it's almost uh, very nice. So it's, it's, it's very nice, but uh, these two entries are not equal. So I would want to check what I can do to uh, uh, make this two entries equal. And I choose not the complete matrix P, but uh, I, I choose just diagonal because it's clear that I would just need scalings at that point. So I use scalings, I check how this is transformed. I see in, in particular this nice transformation so that uh, if I want this to be equal to this, I have to choose P11 equal to like, I have to choose so P11 should be a, a cubic root or one divided by cubic root of the second derivative. Well, I don't solve any equations here, but I just immediately guess what I need here. So essentially I would need to um, adjust my initial section by this transformation. And I again apply it and get omega two and omega two is now, uh, as I wish, I want this slot to be equal to this slot, but now I get polluted other slots. So I recall that at the next normalization step, I would want to kill this coefficient. So I knew that I would probably do this by choosing some slots uh, here and here. I just choose this one, that would be sufficient. Do the same trick, adjust my section, check what I add, uh, get at this two, two slot, which I would want to kill, solve it and see that I have to choose P12 as that one. So it's very instructive and tells me, well, how do I adjust my initial section? To end up in the sub is the normalization subspace I would want to get. So at each step, I shift a little bit uh, the point to end up in the right uh, so, uh, sub bundle. And yes, so I again, so this is the transformation I have to choose now. So I uh, again uh, check what I end up get after adjusting my uh, section by this transformation. And now it looks better. So I have now, I, I see that I have zero here. I have this two coefficients equal. And now the only uh, remaining normalization is that I would want to, to have these two slots equal, which, are, which are, of course are not equal. And this I can achieve by using this P, P02. And again, I repeat the same thing. I, I, yeah, I just solve the equation. Uh, and this is how I have to choose P02. So this is pretty ugly matrix I end up with. Uh, and uh, I again adjust my section, end up again with, uh, with, with uh, what I wanted to um, get. So it doesn't fit into a single screen now, so it looks really ugly. Uh, so this is my final uh, form omega. After uh, I've chosen, uh, I went through all normalization conditions. So I check that I need a uh, seat in the right subspace. So, um, and yes, so two, two is zero, one, two is equal to two, three, one, three, and one, three is what remains. So this is the slot uh, that gives me the relative invariant. 
And you see it immediately here. So this is the expression in the nominator that corresponds exactly to the relative invariant uh, we have seen before. And again, uh, I'm not probably very smart with this maple computations. This could be done in, in a much smarter way. But what it demonstrates is that at each step, I just solve linear algebraic equations to uh, make sure that I uh, perform the right normalization and adjust my section. And I, at the end, I arrived uh, at, at the, well, at the semi-canonical moving frame. I call it semi-canonical because I still have a bundle. So I have still some freedom sitting over a curve. Uh, but already at that step, I recover quite some information, in particular, uh, this relative invariant here. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, this is what I wanted to uh, show. Uh, questions? Thank you very much. So uh, any questions? Just one question, just double check. So this, um, <clears throat> So this decomposition into two pieces, uh, yep. one that you get from Tanaka propagation, the form you get from Tanaka propagation, and then the, this other stuff. Is is this always going to be decomposition as modules for that Tanaka propagation? Uh, right, so I mean, as the other stuff in, in, in this particular example was like this omega zero two. Yeah, so let's, let's probably just display this here, uh, yeah. So it's a decomposition in, in what sense? Yeah, at that moment it's, uh, yeah. So uh, that probably is uh, already part of the second live chair, but the first, the first piece is well-defined. This is just the symmetry. We have no freedom here. It is uniquely defined by our symbol as a prolongation of the symbol. So the second piece, is somewhat arbitrary. So I, that's a choice uh, we have to make when we do the prolongation procedure. And uh, ideally, ideally we would want it to, to satisfy some uh, additional conditions. So what are these conditions? Uh, first of all, uh, it should be small enough to ensure that we get uh, a, a nice frame, nice reduction. Uh, second, it should ideally be uh, uh, satisfy some invariancy conditions. And these invariancy conditions are exactly saying that, like, uh, that this subspace is invariant with respect to the structure, the remaining structure group of the reduced bundle. And this remaining structure group of the reduced bundle is exactly the uh, stabilizer of the flat model. Okay, so in, in this case, you do get an invariant, an invariant decomposition. In this case, uh, I get uh, the decomposition where I get this first piece defining me the intrinsic geometry, and the second piece will be uh, uh, a well, uh, well, an equivariant form that defines me the invariance or fundamental invariance, if you wish. But uh, I will, I will start developing general theory uh, during the last lecture. Okay, great. Okay. Probably repeat this in, in much more detail. Yep. And uh, as an exercise, uh, uh, we have this G2 example, so we'll be returning to them and seeing what kind of normalization condi conditions we will be getting there. Okay. And, and I hear the interest that, uh, uh, that we would want to uh, control the number of derivatives we are taking. So we would want to know where exactly. Uh, how many exactly absolute and invariant and relative invariants we will be getting in each of such branches? Are there any other questions? If not, let's thank Boris again for a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. thank you.